And other people have their versions. It, it doesn't need to be any kind of motion with your legs. It could be singing. It could be some kind of, of wish that you've had. I don't think it's doing more work. I really don't. I mean, like, get, get that one out of your head. Mm -hmm. It's really to let yourself say, what am I passionate about that I'm not doing now? And I used to play the piano and I loved it. And I haven't taken out the music and played the piano for 25 years. I haven't had time. Well, that's of course not true. You have had time. We all have time for the things that keep us going, right? But maybe that's what you do. Maybe you spend three hours a week playing the piano. I feel like as I say these things, they may sound trite. And I, I'm just, I'm just telling you from my own experience. And, and, but also, don't let your kids get you down. You know, I find, I, I try to find 10 minutes a year when all three of my kids like me at the same time. You know, and then I'm a success. And you just have to lower your expectations. That's for sure. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and um, and talk to you a little bit about the organizations that you've you've you created or you you know helped to establish. Um, and you know you've done it in so many different ways. You've done it um, in, in so many different sectors. So um, in academia um, at Harvard, one you know one most influential universities uh, in the world, and uh, making sure that the women in public policy um, aspect was high on the agenda. And you've done it also in philanthropy. Um, you know, you put yourself on the line, your own you understood your own privilege, and you brought that to bear in, in the philanthropic world. And you've also done it in civil society, um, whether it's through organizations like Inclusive Security, or I think as I think it was preceded with Women Waging Peace as well. So uh, there's there's some things there that you've done, um, and that you've had particular motivations around it. In this given time now, this this changing time, um, you know, I, I'm i really interested in, in how do we raise all women up, understanding homogeneity, it, you know, it doesn't exist among women, that some of us have a great deal more privilege than others. How are you ensuring now that women who are historically underrepresented in leadership spaces, in any of those those different sectors that you've been working, are, are being you know, look at, are given the opportunities and are also being elevated, whether it's indigenous women or, you know, women of color, persons of color, um, differently abled, or, you know, those that are um, identifying with the two-spirited LGBTQ communities. So what, what how has the, the nature of your work changed and, and how are the organizations responding to that? It's through the one sector that you didn't name, and that is the political because I had chaired for the governor um, in Colorado, I had chaired his work on housing, affordable housing and homelessness and had worked on a reform of the mental health system, which turned out to be successful. Okay. But what I knew is that Ronald Reagan, like the year before, with a stroke of the pen had wiped out 70% of the U.S. budget for affordable housing. And when we say affordable housing, we mean housing for low-income people. Now, if he could do that with, as I said, a stroke of a pen, like why was I spending my time organizing coalitions from civil society, et cetera, et cetera, when, I, when he had so much power and that's when I decided to go to the mayor, to go to the governor. That's how I ended up creating this coalition of my coalition. I, the governor said, look, we don't have anything for housing and homelessness. You care about this. You keep bugging me about this. You've been in this office three times, five times. You just go and do it. And that's because I kept coming to his office over and over. And I have, I'm a real believer that one of the projects you didn't name is called, and you did at the beginning, Seismic Shift. And that's because after Hillary Clinton, 
I even have trouble saying lost because it was stolen. But anyway, after she became, not, she didn't become president, her thought and my thought and many other people's thoughts were there are so many women in this country and around the world who will be discouraged. And the number of women in the US Congress is going to go down. And instead, we had 40,000 women who were going to different organizations saying, I want to run for office. We had 40,000. And that's, that's a huge, huge number. And so it turned out to have an opposite effect. It was partly because we had what really echoed around the world, which is the Women's March. And I know there were versions of that, and those were put together on the day of the inauguration. But Hillary Clinton took on as part of her job in life to encourage women to run. And I then, oh, look, I, 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 my role is minuscule. It's tiny, tiny. But I decided that I, my energy behind getting women to run for those higher offices. And I mean, I, I can write a check to some of them, and I do, but that isn't nearly as important as they're receiving a letter, even with just a few lines, with that ambassador uh, letterhead. And it says, Dear Susan, you didn't win the last, the last time, but run again. You know where all the money is in your state. People have gotten used to uh, having a woman. You have name recognition. You're smart. Run again. And trying to figure out how, like I, I signed, I don't know, hundreds of those. And figuring out how to do things that uh, may be what we call outside the box to get more and more and more women into the Congress. And now about 38, 40% of the Democrats in the Congress are women. And God bless them, the poor Republicans are only about 7% or 8%. And I say God bless them because, you know, even though you know I'm an ardent Democrat, obviously, and not a Republican still, we need to have a two-party system. And the women, when they're in such a small minority, it's very hard for them to say, well, I disagree with this bill that my Republican colleagues are putting forward. I mean, to be that tiny voice in your party, and then you get thrown out and, you know, et cetera. Uh, they're in really bad shape, and I'd like to find a way to help them. So I go see them, and I say, listen, um, I'd like to work with you and um, and make sure there are more women, Republican women who are running. You can mentor, and I want to be really clear. I'm never going to support you. I'm never going to support your campaign. In fact, I'll work against you, but I really want you to get more women in the Republican Party to run. You know, and I'm really honest, and they think, who is this woman? And then they say, gosh, you know, she's telling the truth. And all of that encouragement of people in the other party, I think, makes a very big difference because it's so unexpected. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, um, I, 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 we're obviously all watching what's going on in the U.S. right now with, you know, with bated breath, we're hoping for better outcomes, I think, ultimately on all sides. Um, in I'd like to shift, um, I think, to the to the global nature. I'm hearing also in the comments um, that, you know, there's, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people that are interested in the work that you've been doing around peace and security, and particularly around women's leadership in those spaces. Um, and I, a couple of people have said, you know, they're obviously giving us some really good examples of what's going on in their countries, which I think we should try to come back to. But they're also saying, you know, let's talk a little bit about the structural issues that that women are facing when trying to get into those political spaces, particularly mm -hmm. in terms of women's leadership. So 
I wondered if you could speak to that and then I'll turn over to Farhad as well after that. Yeah, please. And oh, I can't tell you how much I wish that we were in a big conversation. You know, I mean, I would love to hear the ideas of the other people who are listening to these ideas. That That's my idea of a good time. All right. So here's my experience. And I've worked in um, between 40 and 60 war zones. Right. So my experience is that during a conflict, the women who are very, very involved in and absorbed by and uh, can, can think of nothing else. And this is why it's important to say it that way. They can think of nothing else but getting clean water for the refugee camp, for stopping the torching and burning down of the homes. 60% was destroyed in Bosnia for breaking up a rape camp, for all of those things, they're saints. Meanwhile, there is someone or ones who are political leaders, who are the men, and they know that if their side wins, there's going to be not just a prime minister and a president, there's going to be a secretary of the interior or minister of the interior, one for defense, one for foreign affairs, one for agriculture. And people, meaning men, have already lined up for those jobs. And the and I go and I talk to the women, you you care about starvation. You've got to become the secretary of agriculture. And she said, look, look, I'm getting three hours of sleep at night trying to get food to those refugee camps. And I said, yeah, I know, but, but you've got to think ahead and you've got to think of your best and highest use. And you, and you know what? I have a very, very, very hard time getting through that, that idea. And so I think that that's where someone like Mobina Jaffer comes in who can come in from Canada, but also as a minority woman you know, in the Senate, and she can say, look, to, to the women on the ground, she can say, um, think about the round six in Darfur, in the talks. And the talks were going nowhere, 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 nowhere. And then uh, Senator Jaffer says, wait a minute, I've seen this movie before, right? And we need to bring in some women. And she does. And there's a whole story that goes to that. And the men are arguing about who gets the river. That's the negotiation. Who is getting the river? And they're not agreeing on that. So they're staying at war and who is who is suffering, right? But the, the women and the children. And so one of the women says, uh, you, you know that that river doesn't exist. That river dried up a long time ago. Well, how did she know? First of all, it's a very funny story, right? I mean, I think it's funny if it weren't tragic, but how did she know that? Is it because she has a bigger heart? No. Is it because, I mean, she may have a bigger heart, okay? But that's not why she knew about the river. And is it because um, she is politically savvy? No. It's because she fetches the water. So it's a social role, it's experience that gives her information that is critical to that negotiation. And you can take that example and multiply it by 100,000 in a year because the women bring something to the table. Uh, yes, we know they are superior. Sorry, uh, viewers who don't think that, but they're superior at working across aisles. They are superior in terms of intuition. They read body language, but they also make sure that the community concerns, meaning what happened to make the river dry up, those are in the peace agreement. 
And because of those community concerns that are now in the peace agreement, those peace agreements are much more likely to last. And, you know, peace agreements last for about five years. But if you look at a 20 year mark, and that will predict stability and that will predict the end of war. They are about 75% more likely to reach that goal if there are women actively involved in that peace agreement in significant ways. And as I said, is it because they're smarter? Uh, no, they are smarter, but never mind, that's not why. And uh, it's, it's because they have different experience that they made sure got put into the peace agreement. Uh, amazing. I mean, um, I've been part of your Women Waging Peace Network in Pakistan, and you have been supporting a lot of women and peace builders across the world, in fact. And I was part of, as I shared with you, I was there with you in Washington as well. So, um, and seeing all the journey of Women Waging Peace Network concept and then executing and across the world sharing. Uh, leadership journeys and uh, encouraging women to be the peace leaders. Um, what are your most proud moments among across overall the journey of women building peace network? And what are the disappointments that you have learned from that experience, um, Ambassador? The most proud uh, moment, or one of them, was when we got the U.S. Congress to pass a law saying that the National Action Plan, which is a strategic plan that there are now about, I don't know, 60, 70 countries now that have these plans, they're multi-year, multi-agency, et cetera. These are plans to elevate women. The US Congress said that each year, the people, the organizations that are part of the government who are participating in that plan. So that might be the Department of State, which is our foreign affairs. It might be um, Homeland Security, which most of you know, but um, they, they look for terrorist organizations, but they also control visas, et cetera. And it might be the Department of Defense. It might be the Treasury, which deals with arms, et cetera. Um, all of those have to uh, have to report to Congress, to the U.S. Congress, about what they're doing to uphold the national plan, and that is structural, and that took years and years. That one was a marathon, not a sprint. And boy, to get something like that passed. That means I was in the offices, and when, when I would do some of the, the lobbying, the advocacy work, um, I was in the offices of the most liberal and of the most conservative, and, and of the people who were real believers in women, and the people who didn't know how to spell women. And, um, you know, I was. We worked and we worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And when that passed, it was it was a joy. It was a great joy. Because as you said, um, there, there were, have been a lot of organizations that have been in there making the case. We have had the privilege of working with a lot of those. And so... We could be there um, as a coalition, but you know, the fact that I have the word ambassador in front of my, in front of Swanee, it means I can get in to see almost anyone in the U.S. Congress. And that's just reality. I mean, that's thank you, Hillary Clinton, because she's the one who made sure I was ambassador. You're on mute. Okay. What are the challenges that you faced, uh, Ambassador? Because there might be a lot of challenges in Women Waging Peace Network, and of course, a lot of disappointments. Uh, what were those and how you overcome them? Okay. Right. Well, Especially. yeah, for me, it's, it's when we work with the leaders in a country and 
and it seems like we're moving forward and for it might be Israel Palestine you know we had such great women who came to our first year in 1999 when we brought women from 10 different conflict areas and we wanted to get um, conflicts different stages some that were just beginning some that were in the most dangerous and some that were healed and we asked Israel and Palestine to come these delegations because their conflict was healed well no and and so that that's hard because we've you know, we've gotten to know these women. We know what it's like back home with all of the uh, the arms build up and the lack of trust. And, um, and, and so the important thing is to do something that we haven't done, to do it differently. And so to help the Israeli and Palestinian women create um, a their own... Um, coalition there between Palestinian and um, and Israelis and and that works for a lot of the time and then things get so bad so bad that the Palestinians say we can't be in a coalition with the Israelis because we're being co-opted by the, the Israelis if we do that and and you know then I and many others, you know, I'm in Israel, and then I'm in Ramallah, and, and meeting with uh, political leaders, but, you know, often meeting with my students, who are, who are the political leaders, and, you know, that's another, that's a great joy to see, um, you know, I have, I think, 800 students roaming around the world, and, and so um, I think that's maybe, that's maybe um, the most important to me success is that next generation and the next and the next. And, and I think about Lillian and me under the desk and, and how hard it is, that sense of passing it on to the next generation and feeling sometimes like I'm like, I'm just curled up in a fetal position underneath that desk. And then to say, okay, okay, get a grip, you know, get out, get, get out and get up. And you're going to figure it out. And you've got some really, really helpful people like Farhat and Eileen. And, you know, there, there are a lot of people there to help me stand up again. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Master, most of the participants of Women Waging Peace Network uh, across the countries were mostly people who are educated, who knows about peace building or social sciences. The women who are rural, and uh, many of the comments that are coming, of course, they are asking about, I mean, women from the rural backgrounds and their voices. Um, especially when you see women from Afghanistan, for example, or women from Yemen, or women from Kashmir region, or you know, people from where, where, where you know, rural women have a very strong place. For example, in Pakistan, for example, we see in Punjab or interior Sin, we see a lot of rural women who are who are thriving and making their own ways, uh, not having these kind of opportunities, but they're you know building on, for example, they're building their small and medium enterprises and, and such kind of projects. So what are your thoughts on, 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 for example, people in Africa? I mean, the amazing women we see uh, who had built from scratches and, inter and you know, enterprise it and, you know, let um, some amazing, uh, within the communities, built empowerment of their own so what, do, what are your thoughts on that, on building such kind of projects and supporting them as well? Right, right. Well, I was in Liberia uh, with my friend Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who now had been become president. And uh, I asked her, what can I do that would be the most helpful? You need everything. You know, you've been through a 14-year war. You need everything. You need electricity. You need running water. 
you need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, you know, I'll be able to find international help for that. I want you to do what other people don't do, which is I want you to work with my women leaders. So that's part of it, is to believe that if you get the right people in the power positions who have the sensitivity for the women who are in the rural areas, that's, that's just one way. That's one way to go about it. Um, but it's the way that, that I tend to think. And, and then I'm in uh, Rwanda, and as you know, I wrote a book, Rwandan Women Rising, and I was there for 17 years, in and out, in and out, and I saw how the women became 64% of the parliament and half the president's cabinet and half the Supreme Court. And they did it with this grassroots push up from the bottom and, and then a pull from the top from the president. And that's how they got themselves into 30% of the parliament. And they were so good at it that then the women in that 30% said, you know what, I have name recognition. I know a lot about this country. The country knows me, I'm gonna run against the men. And I'm gonna let my sisters have one of the seats that are set aside. And that's how they became 64%. But the women who were in that push up from the bottom, they couldn't read or write. You know, in fact, when they were at home, if there were men present in their home other than family, they couldn't speak. It was taboo. And then there was this chaos of this genocide. And the chaos, here's the irony, the chaos cracked open the culture. And now you had this vacuum and the women rushed into that breach. They surged into the breach. And it, it's the most remarkable story how that happened. And then they, and they created their own women's village councils because they couldn't speak if they were at home. But in a women's council, that's all it was, was women speaking. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And then they voted to the next level and the next level. By the time they got to the top, they had run for office five times. And then they were ready to go and be in those set aside seats. And, you know, it was, you know, in, in Liberia, on the other side of, of the continent, in Africa, it was the market women it was the women who had their big baskets and they were selling spices or fish or whatever they were selling in the market. They are the ones who are credited with electing Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And one of the, when I've been there, one of the stories told to me is that the women who had the education, they would go and sit by the baskets in the market and carry on the business while the market women would go and vote. And I, I mean, I can hardly tell that story without wanting to cry. It's just, you see how, and that's in a completely indigenous model that you would never, you would never even write up and take to another country and say, why don't you do it this way? You know, I mean, we certainly would write up and say, why don't you have a loan project and get 10 of you and everyone has your small business and, and no one gets any more um, funding until all of the different loans are paid back. I mean, and that's a great model, but who knows what indigenous models, what other ones are. And Eileen, I hope that you are cataloging this kind of, Thing. You know, we, we ought to have a thousand of those examples written up. I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, the question is, even as we're busy women trying to do all the work, how do we get to get to a place where we're more effectively capturing that information? I think, you know, the work that you did on your book, for example, um, Rob Wan and Women Rising, 
Um, the great thing about that is that it's re elevating women's stories, their own stories with their name on it. And I think that's, uh, that's something we want to continue to ensure happens. Um, I want to come back to some of the comments and, and the feedback, um, but um, and maybe ask it in a broader question. Um, we've had been, you know, both Farhat and I in our respective parts of the world and our organizations, we, we've been having a lot of conversations recently with um, our peers, our partners, our graduates um, who are living in, in protracted conflict zones. Um, you know, some of them you've already uh, indicated. Um, I know colleagues right now working in Yemen, Cameroon, these women on the front lines, they're exceptional. They're not only providing frontline services, but they're also advocating for peace and they're trying to push their own leadership agenda forward. They're trying to they're build their own leadership capacity. And now on top of it, we have a pandemic. Um, which is complicating everything again. So, I mean, how do you see the work, the work that we need to be doing on, on particularly for women peace builders and women's leadership in peace building, how do you see it shifting now with all this extra complexity that we have with crisis and conflict and, you know, and pandemic? And what does, what do we need as an international community, especially need to think about and consider with programs and projects that we are, we are undertaking? Right. Well, I, I can say a couple of things, but it won't be at the programs and projects level. But mm -hmm. I would very, very much like to hear and read about your work as you've been considering that. Um, one is that a description of the women who uh, are heading up countries that are the most successful in dealing with the the pandemic. They are way disproportionately women, women led. And so the question becomes, why? And um, do you want, I may have, I may have the, I may be able to rattle off, yeah. <clears throat> they are Denmark, Norway, Finland, Iceland, New Zealand, Taiwan, and Germany. And their leadership is saving millions of lives. And um, what is it about what they're doing? And one is, uh, it's about leadership qualities. And if you look at you know, whether or not they are more careful or not, or you know if they are more oriented toward safety rather than, than pushing the economy, et cetera, in, the, in any given moment. Those all count. But the other thing that counts in a huge way and is difficult to measure, and that is humility. And that is the flip side to what I was saying about women not being confident enough when Hillary Clinton interviews them. And it's that lack of, uh, it's a lack of overconfidence. Obviously, they're confident enough to become president of their country, right? But once they get there, they don't have the sense of, I have the answers. And that's the key. Do they think they have the answers? Because you know what? They don't. They don't have the answers because you know why? Nobody does. And so what we can do as an international community is find ways to collaborate, to collaborate, to collaborate. And again, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, when Ebola hit Liberia, first thing she did was figure out what's a regional plan here. Liberia can't do this by ourselves. What is the regional plan? And how do we get the attention of the international community? Mm, really good points. You know, um, the work that we do at uh, Cody Institute, um, and uh, it has really been um, driven towards ensuring that what we are, uh, what our work is, is the accompaniment of citizen leaders, of advancing citizen-led community-driven development. And recognizing that, as you said, we don't have all the answers, but what we do have is the ability to support and to help. 
and to you know elevate voices, particularly voices of women leaders. Um, so you know understanding and appreciating, as you've said, um, the expertise that already exists on the ground and and going in with humility is is absolutely essential. Um, so we've we've gotten a lot of comments, Farhat. I'm going to go through some of them, and if you point out a few. Um, we're down to our last 15 minutes with Ambassador Hunt, and I'm just thinking about the richness of what we are seeing here in terms of the of the comments. And I want to say that at Cody and with the IPDS, we're committed to putting all this information together and sharing it with everybody with along with the recording. Um, but I will just, if I could, um, colleagues have been telling me some of the key ones that they've been pointing out. There's one person that wrote, there are women who need help and women who can help. There are women who lead and there are women who need. Uh, women who can lead are struggling specifically in political decision-making spaces. And women are demanding for their participation, not asking for rights, but for their roles and responsibilities too. Women are ready to lead. They just need the space and the attention to listen to their perspective, opinion, and solution. The world is in need of change, and for this women's perspective, approaches and leadership is so important. I think that's the kind of message I think we can really get behind. And, you know, others, you know, coming back to a comment you made earlier, um, right from the beginning, is about male champions and, and looking for ways in which we, we also, um, uh, we also uh, indicate as women how, these, how men can support us not to take away our voice, but also to look at ways in which they can also be responsibly adding. So these are the some of the things that are coming up. There's also some very specific comments that are coming from particular conflict affected countries and, and women that are working there. Farhat, is there anything that you're seeing that you want to also add on in comments? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of uh, wonderful comments that are coming from different parts of the world. There are people who are asking about specifically focusing on COVID crisis and how women are, you know, dealing with all these challenges, uh, especially uh, with, with all the, um, you know, increased challenge. I think that it has it has put them on a, on spot more as, as compared with what they were facing before. Um, and then, you know, a lot of questions are asking about um, your own um, leadership journey from now onwards to uh, what are what are your plans? And few of the questions that are coming, I mean, there are a lot of phenomenal um, women leaders who are at the table, you know, around us as well. And there, are, I mean, you can share about your, I mean, these voices. How do you see these voices being amplified from from this place to from now to onwards when we are facing this COVID crisis? Um, and especially when you when you're writing those and documenting all those voices, specifically uh, recently published your book on Rwanda Woman Rising, where you had also documented and you had interviewed a lot of uh, women from that ground. Um, and you're, then you, you write those uh, stories, you document those stories and you share with all the, all the world of those stories. So, one question is that where you will taking those stories forward from now to to far, where we see as future, and then what is the motivation behind writing and documenting those stories? How important is it for you to document and you know share? Uh, may I, as happens so often, may I start with the last one? Okay, so. <laughs> <Do that. laughs> okay. So, okay, so I'm, I'm sitting at the dinner table, and uh, it's my husband and my son, who's about 10 years old. And so I'm writing a book on Bosnia, and it's called, This Was Not Our War, and which is a quote that one of the 26 women that I interviewed for seven years, that was her comment. And, and he said, Mom, you couldn't go to a movie with us tonight. I said, yeah, I know, I'm working on my book. And he said, yeah, but, but why are you working on this book? Who's gonna buy this book? I said, well, it's a good question. I said, you know, Teddy, maybe nobody. And then he felt sorry for me. So he said, Mom, listen, someday someone's going to write the history of that war 
and they're going to go to a library <laughs> and they're going to go up a ladder and they're going to find your book <laughs> on the top of this shelf and they're going to bring it down and it'll become part of history. Now, I have remembered that for you know 25 years and and that's how it is. In fact, that is how it is. That it's critically important that we write these stories for the sake of history. Because women will be written out of history and history becomes the story of men killing other men, right? Um, but the other piece is, when I wrote that particular book, the women whom I was talking with for all those years and with a video camera, uh, they were wealthy and they were poor. And they were atheist and they were Muslim and they were Roman Catholic and they were Orthodox Catholic and they were non-believers, you know, and they were as different people as I could possibly find. And so they would tell me stories and I never said, tell me a story about how you reached across the line. Did not. All I said was, tell me what happened, period. And they would start talking about the war, and that's when one of them said, this was not our war, et cetera. But I said, well, what was life like for you before the war? And so a woman says, uh, well, I remember my daughter going to church and how, how cute she looked in her white dress because she was going for First Communion. And so now I know mm -hmm. it's the Roman Catholic. Okay, so that's a little bit of information for me. And she said, and a lot of her friends and their families came. I said, okay. And then they came over to our home and I made sure, oh, I said like, well, what did you have to eat? And, and she said, well, I made sure that we didn't have any pork so that our friends would be able to have something to eat. But now I know that we have Roman Catholic with Muslim. And those stories over and over and over explain to me why they would say this is not an ethnic war, this is not a religious war. It was a power grab by a despicable political leader who then ended up accused and of being a war criminal and he died before he was convicted, but you know, Slobodan Milosevic. Mm. Meanwhile, all of us on the outside in the media, radio, print, et cetera, we were all writing about how this is a religious war. And if it's a religious war, you know what? People don't want to get involved in trying to stop it because religious wars, you get this feeling, oh, geez, you know, there's no right, there's no wrong. Everyone says God's on their side. And so that was part of the ploy of Milosevic to put it out that it's a religious war. So you had to have the stories of everyday life. And that's what the women were able to tell. These were the stories and we didn't have ham so that our daughter's friends could come to the house and eat. Mm. Yeah. You asked a lot of great questions there. It, we, we could e easily take another session with you, I think. I, I did want to flag a, a comment um, uh, and, you know, that I think is really important and here, here in Canada, but also in the U.S., of course, um, you know, we are we are living as settlers on indigenous on indigenous lands. And one of the comments that came up, um, you know, through our Facebook live session also was um, from a woman leader. It's a matrilineal society in northern British Columbia. So on the west coast of Canada. So and it's the Gitsan First Nations. And, you know, she said it's really interesting and it's complicated. She's been listening in because you know they're being governed by a govern they're governed by a government system that is against the values and traditions of, of people so, so of of their people in particular and and the systems don't work for us so I think as women leaders when we're thinking about you know peace and conflict you know uh, I would encourage us to be thinking you know more broadly around peace and conflict but also 
um, you know, our work, our important work as women leaders in dismantling systems that also don't work for, for people that contribute to what you said earlier, which is this was not our war. This mm -hmm. is not what we asked for. So right. that's the kind of feedback that we're, we're getting, I think. And there's so many others. And as I said, um, for those that are listening today, um, we're down to our last question with, with Ambassador Hunt because we're running out of time. But I'm tracking all of the information that you've sent in. And we're going to be sharing that with Ambassador Hunt as well as sharing it with all of you in, uh, following the, the session today. So Farhat, the last question for Ambassador Hunt, who's been very generous with her time. Yes, exactly, Eileen. And I'm so overwhelmed and happy that today Ambassador Hunt had, you know, very candidly shared her own journey over the time, you know, over the times. Um, Ambassador Hunt, you wrote, I mean, wonderful books. And the last question would definitely be asking you to 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 read some of the extract from the book from a part that you really want to share. And then considering those stories and the impact and the words that you use in those stories um these are the lessons right and these are the lessons that you want to share with the world so this is not so you know but those lessons are not just for only for i mean only for the peace building but also for the state building so what are the lessons that you really want to share with women who are there growing in front of us as leaders and what are the lessons that you really want to share with them who are on the path towards the journey as myself, as I'm mentored by Eileen, I'm in the middle. I'm not Ambassador Hunt and I'm not Eileen. So I'm just in the middle. So what are the lessons that you would like to share with those who are just in the middle and reaching to the positions that we really want? Uh, well, I don't have something to read you, but I do want to critique you since I'm a teacher. There is no such thing as just in the middle. You're not, you're not just... I couldn't agree middle. more with you. Thank you. I said that to her already before. We're too humble. <laughs> and everybody, listen to your language. Maybe that's what I want to say. And help each other listen to your language. And next time you hear, well, I don't know if this makes sense, but blah, 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 blah. Stop yourself or stop your friend. What? Uh, why are you saying? I mean, if you don't know it makes sense, then don't say it. I don't want to hear it. Don't take my time. You know, don't start with, I don't know if this makes sense. Just say it. Or you say, well, this could be crazy, but you know what? If you think it could be crazy, don't take my time. Just put it out there. Just put out your idea and see what happens. And our uh, no one is just in the middle. Uh, try this one on. I'm just a mother. You know, I'm sitting here, or, or um, I'm just, uh, I only made it to primary school. Yeah, all the ways we take away our power. And that's different from somebody else taking it away, right? I think they're connected. I think we feel powerless often because we've had so much power in the system that has been since we that we've not experienced. But oh that means I'm supposed to take my mid my midday medicine. So maybe we should Wow well, that's that sounds <laughs> the music couldn't have been timed any better than Ambassador <laughs> Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and thank you for those final comments because I think uh, again I will just reiterate um, what you've said about women. Women, you know, I I have an allergy, for example, to the word emerging, emerging oh. leader. My colleagues who are on the line know this. We we sometimes talk about youth leaders or we talk about young women as emerging leaders, and to me, there's no such thing. You are a leader. Um, it's not something you're born with uh, necessarily, although people have many traits that they might bring to the table. There's leadership in, in, in so many women all among, all around us, whether it's political or other spaces. So um, I'm going to say so much, uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Um, as we've said earlier, we could have done, you know, two, maybe three different sessions. There's so much that we could unpack the questions that have been coming in, the 
the, the insights that have been shared also, the, the expertise that's been shared in our chat function um, is quite tremendous. Um, so on behalf of Farhat and myself and Farhat, thank you so much for all the work you've done. And you know my colleagues at the Cody Institute as well. And to your colleagues, um, uh, Ambassador Hunt at the Inclusive Security and at the, at the Harvard School, Thank you so much for your time today, and we look forward to continuing a conversation with you um, in the in the in the months to come. So thank you so much. Sure, and, and and yes, thank you to the viewers, and we will find a way somehow for us to get together again. Yeah, Eileen, you must share about the upcoming conference there in uh, in the Cody. You must care about that. Thank well. you so much. Thank you, Farhad. You're advertising for me. So Cody Institute, um, working with community leaders all around the world. One thing I will say is that my colleagues in the International Center for Women's Leadership here at Cody Institute at the university are putting together the plans right now for a, a, an online virtual women's peace and security conference that will be taking place in the fall and will be really excited to share more information with everybody that's taken part today, including Ambassador Hunt. Um, yeah. And the, the intent of that, that conference will really, again, to be um, to rise up women's voices um, around the world, working at the grassroots and ensure that they are given the same amount of attention as any of us that are more privileged in our positions would get and, and have a lively conversation about the 20th anniversary in particular of 1325. UN Resolution 1325. So stay Thank tuned. You. Thanks, Farhat. And thanks, everybody, again. Thank this concludes our session. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hunt. Thank you so much, Eileen. And thank you to colleagues in the Hunt, you know, Inclusive Security as well. Thank you, Eileen, for, for you know, supporting me. And, you know, um, and ladies and gentlemen who are with us uh, for this special exclusive episode of Global Women Inside that I started. It's just... Uh, just the beginning. We are just giving voices to the um, and spotlighting women leaders as Ambassador Hunt, so that we can sit down them with them and learn from them, and you know share their insights and how we can all navigate through all the challenges that we are facing as leaders. Thank you so much, both of you, and thank you so much, everyone from across the world who had joined us today. Good night, everyone from Pakistan. Good night. Good afternoon from from Canada. Thank you.